Okay. It's okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So I was well, saying, I'm Rodrigo Aguilera. I work here in Barcelona. I'm from Madrid. I work at Imbra, and uh, sometimes I contribute to Drupal Multilingual. Uh, hi everyone. I'm I'm Pedro, and um, I'm a Drupal freelance. I used to work here in Barcelona. I now work in London, and um, I've been in Drupal for a for a long time. So, so, <laughs> what do we mean with with quality? Because that could be a, a very strange or very broad concept. Um, um, we are going to um, talk in this uh, in this session about how how can you get um, better communication in, inside your team? How can how can you get uh, an increase on transparency in both um, code and processes and that will uh, result in a better ownership of the of the code base, and um, how can uh, processes and the deadlines can be can be solid and meaningful instead of uh, being a date set by someone else. And um, this one is a is a very very uh, challenging one. Not making the same mistake twice. We, we'll talk about that. And. Um, and that this is 80% um, attitude and 20% toolbox. And we are going to show tools here, but those are just for a framework or demonstration purposes. Um, and um, the main goal is um, how to get you peace of mind on your development processes. But we know that this is kind of a nirvana thing, but the closer you can get, the best, right? And we, we split this, this talk in three three parts. We're going to talk about peer review. We're going to talk about how to make processes that increase communication between the team. Um, we're going to talk uh, about testing very, very in, in a, um, passing it uh, in a very overview uh, mode. And we are going to talk a bit about deployments and things and how can you sleep at night. And, um, the first part is um, code review. Well, the first thing that I wanted to ask you, how many of you consider that you do code review inside your team? OK, that's, that's good. That's great, that's great. So I'm here because it really changed my life as a developer, and I want to talk about it. And I think for those of you who don't do who doesn't consider that that's code review in or peer review inside your team, I think it will happen eventually. So why? I'm not going to criticize you about amongst the ones of you who does code review. Everyone does code review the way they like it, or the way they are comfortable with. And we'll be finding like code, bad code in the wild, so I think there's not enough code review being performed. So, uh, it's a process that improves quality, but reducing defects, everyone is on the code, so uh, express code ownership, and it helps new people on board on their team because they get a new sense of the code, and it's a learning experience for, for everyone on the team. Uh, and it helps you spending time the moment you have it because you solve the problems before than when there is a thing breaking in production than when you don't have the time and <coughs> things might break. So, Ken Reeves is sad because nobody does code review. <coughs> and, well, phrases that you heard in the wild is like, my code is a perfect snowflake. So we are programmers, and we should be able not just coding, but to communicate the changes that we make to the project and things about things. And there might be ego involved in it. So we are going to show you how to get the ego out of the, out of the problem. And well, if you say I'm too busy to do code review, uh, maybe you need to convince yourself First, about code quality, like how it's important, how it's important to have code standards. And some say that code review slows processes, but as I was telling you, fixing a bug 
during production is much more uh, expensive than doing it during the code review process. And if you're worried about the IDA, there is a bunch of tools that help you to do that. And you should be prepared. Some stuff that must be done before. Like, for example, try to make everything code. Like, not only your logic of your application, but the way you deploy, uh, the boilerplate code you use for that, and uh, you name it. I mean, uh, try to review everything. Not only the logic in it, the configuration, the file names, if you use third-party code, uh, you're not going to review all the code, but maybe you review the likes that it has on GitHub, the stars, or if it's a patch on, on Drupal.org, try to review that patch if it's small. And if it can be diffed, it can be reviewed. And uh, maybe you're interested in diffing images. There is tools for that. And if your project requires, do it. And there is challenges. For example, if you use SAS, to generate your CSS, you don't want to review the CSS. You just do want to review the the SAS, and if you include the CSS in the repo, that might set the challenge, you know? So it's going to be a change, but it's going to be fun. So finally, the code is going to be read by someone. That comment that I'm writing, I'm not writing for my future self, like you sometimes we say. It's, I'm writing it for the whole team. And sometimes I heard, oh, can you have a look at my chains? But if you don't have a process established, that never happens, actually. So code activity is visible because it's what we do day to day, guys. It's, it's uh, every commit, it's every, every, every member of the team can see it. And introduce iteration in improvements. What I'm trying to say with this is that uh, code review encourages to make smaller changes, so the changes you, you introduce in the application are smaller and it can be iterated. And supports conversations, because we are going to introduce you to some tools that are going to be the, where you have the conversations about code, and that's great to be able to talk about the code. And um, the code ownership is very important, like, no one is to blame, like not one person, but if there is a problem, we are a team at the end of the day, and we are going to solve it together. And, well, that's the thing. We are not individuals. We are a team. Let's, let's face it together. And for newcomers in the team, it's great. I cannot emphasize enough how good is code review for this or peer review. Uh, I'm Rodrigo, and I'm going to tell you my story. When code review was introduced in my team, I was a bit fresh and I was grumpy when someone was telling me like, no, do it this way, but it works. But I, but I was learning and I started to love it. And that's, that's a great experience. And uh, when they, when a new member is introduced in the team, they come to do code and they want to get code committed. But this process makes them think about code, you know? And because they need the feedback, actually, to get their change committed, that gets them into the process of getting feedback, give feedback, and that's, I think, is very healthy. Uh, please leave your ego at the door. I mean, if you identify some problems between members of your team, code review might help you talk about these problems. And, yeah, makes incremental changes easier. Like, you have... Bigger changes to review, smaller changes, and the smaller changes are what you're looking for. So everyone in the team has a voice. Um, yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> we have this. Even even the the bad the bad guys in the team have a voice. Um, um, there is this thing in maybe you have heard about it. Um, the and on line in the Toyota production fabrics, the the factories, is that says there there's a string that anyone in the team can you know uh, pull and they will stop the production if there's a quality fault um, I'm not suggesting that you install strings all over your offices like it was a bus or something but um, 
it is very good that everyone in the team feels that they have a voice, that they can say, hey, this may not be the best idea, or I have a better suggestion, or how this is, uh, or this, this should be done in another way. So it is not a way of, um, maybe they are not right, maybe they are, they are plain wrong and that's, that's, that's fine as well. But everyone needs to feel like they can do it, like there is no, um, it is encouraged to, to, pro, um, to uh, propose changes and to propose um, changes in the, in the process. So, everything that I'm saying about code review, like Pedro said, can be applied to processes review. Like, why are we doing all the stuff? So, to get started, please go slow. Maybe you can start with just one team, just one repo, just one project. And please, just the, just the divs, like we do when just we submit patches to Drupal.org, you don't change stuff that is that is around the, the patch, but you focus on the problem. Maybe uh, you just want to review the just the scary, smelly parts because we all know what parts are those and we want to make them better, refactor, things like that. And maybe you want to do code review on demand, but make a process like open a ticket or something. Maybe you can use a post review tool. And in everything fails review bingo, there is like one very old button in Drupal.org that you can go to an issue that needs review and maybe you can try that in your team. So, and one thing very important that I should emphasize is that everyone on the team, like in the end online, should review and get reviews because sometimes you see the, the role of the reviewer and I don't like that all at all. So as I, as I was saying, we have two kinds of tool. The pre-commit tool, that is the most interesting, is what most people, what most tools do, and it works like a firewall for your code, and doesn't get the changes until they are okay, and all the team agrees on them. And it's a great moment to change the architecture of your application. If you have decided on something, it's not written in stone, you can change it. And there is also post-commit or audits, like, you can, with the code that already exists, you can propose changes to it and might be interesting for you. So, automate stuff. Uh, machines can also do some kind of code review. They can talk about coding standards. Maybe they, there's, they are mean. The machines don't say, please, can you review this part of the code? There is a comma missing here. They just tell it to you. So we, as humans, avoid those kind of comments that maybe make us sound pedantic. So they run tests. That's great. If you have a, a test-driven development workflow, they can make continuous integration. There is a lot of tools uh, that uh, detect complexity in your code, duplicate code, maybe test coverage, things like that. And for, as I was saying, for newcomers, for new members of your team, maybe they find it difficult when they find these tools at the beginning, but if you explain them the niceties of coding standards, they will be convinced about it. Uh, but hey, <laughs> we are people and uh, machines are not going to replace us, replace us yet, so we can do a lot of stuff. We can review requirements that needs the, the application. Once we see the code, we have them uh, available. The architecture, if the code being submitted fits the, the architecture that we agreed on, uh, it can make the code future-proof because Drupal 8 and PHP 7 are around the corner and we can write code, code now that fits those requirements. And maybe in our team we have coding idioms, the way we retrieve a node and maybe we wrap it with Entity API or maybe we don't. And that things, that kind of things should be agreed on the team, uh, agreed on the team. And for uh, the code reviews, the members of the team know which functions exist. Maybe they can be re reused. And again, it spreads the knowledge uh, amongst all the members of the team. And guys, review happens in other professions like journalism. Why is not happening in 
in development, in, in software development. So what happens if you don't do code review? You look at the fire and you write, you continue to write your email. It's not a cautionary tale. It's things that you might identify in your team and they might get better. So uh, this happens a lot. Code uh, end up being very personal. There is that part that that guy knows about, and all the teams should be aware of that. Uh, we get a lot of monster code around, all scary. There is no bigger picture of the project, and you get code that is very obscure, very dark because no one looks at it. Uh, technical debt get, gets ignored, things like that. Uh, maybe if you have external contractors, you can get them also into your review process so your code, you get more ownership of the code, things like that. Uh, little code review. And members of the team find it hard to improve the skills in the code writing craft because maybe we work with, we consider that we're working with very intelligent people, very bright, but we are not getting anything really from them because we don't look at their code. We are very busy and this is a very, le it's a learning experience. So for tools, uh, we're going to help you. Well, we're going to give you some examples what I'm currently using. I know there is other tools, but let's see some, some technical size of it. So, uh, mostly they serve us as a workflow and notification management, when to do code review, when to merge, things like that. And they, you have like threads, they make discussions and you can keep them, you can review them later to see what happened. That's very, that's very useful. They're also asynchronous because when you talk about Peer reviews, someone thinks about pair programming, but pair programming is only used for, for, the, for the two people doing it. And there is no record of the discussion, so it's, it's lost. In, and for also for, for remote teams, it's great to have a tool that you hold the discussions on. Uh, some of the tools are very opinionated. They know how you, how you should make the commits, how you should merge them. If you can configure them a bit, but some know how, how you should do your workflow. Uh, for us, the minimum requirements is that you can make diffs. You can make comments under the, under the, the line of code that's being changed and nothing else, but it's nice to have roles to merge the code automatically, to make repairs, noti notifications, and uh, integration with continuous integration, like Jenkins, things like that. So, nope. first tool, very old, patches. We all know from Drupal.org. Uh, it's kind of the legacy way to do code review, but it worked for us to release Drupal 8, so might not be that bad. You need Redditor to, to do a proper code review. It's very handy. Then we have pull requests that are very popular too. Common to GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. That is a very cool tool. And what they are is goodwill code reviews. Like if you don't put any layer on top of GitHub of the pull request, there is anyone can merge stuff like that. Uh, that sometimes makes the, makes the Git history a bit unclean. Uh, well, they work merging code from one branch to another. You get a lot of commits as you are fixing your, your feature, things like that. Um, and well, they are this fancy. Uh, I should mention that there is, well, I think Dries, Dries mentioned something this morning about having branches. So there is also an initiative that is called issue workspace that is kind of having pull requests on Drupal.org. So, and I currently use Garrett for code review. It's 
the tool that I like because it does, it does one thing and does it good. But it also serves as a code repository, as a repo, as a repo, a hosting repo too. Because it takes control over your repo and is Garrett that does the merges of the code, things like that. It allows you to have a clean commit history and introduces the concept of the change pool. The, as a list of changes that you can, that the machines can get and make continuous integration and the developers can also download and make, and make reviews. So there is a lot, a lot of big projects using the, using Garrett, mostly Google projects. Here is a list of changes. You can see a column on the right. That is how big the change is. So before you review it, you know that it's going to take you a long time to review it or not. And this is what mostly encourages to have a, to have a small, a small commit so other people can review it. Um, here I made a GIF on how is the submit step for Garrett. You submit the code and it gets merged automatically. It can be verified by machines. They get like different stream of conversations. The, in a pull request, you only get one, one thread of comments. Then you have the machines apart in Garrett, things like that. It has some drawbacks, like the interface is not, it is not very nice. Actually, has a learning curve because you have to know how Garrett manages the, the repos and the commits. And it's, it's not a drawback that it requires you to define a review process. It's like you enforce you to have a repro uh, review process. So I think that's also cool. And it's also, it's solely pre-commit. There is no audit. You have to make changes and, and commit them. And I wanted to make another example of a post-commit review tool. Like it's a plugin for Redmine and you can open issues and for requests of changes as things that you are, you don't see that they are right. There is other tools. Uh, Atlassian has its own code review tools. Uh, Facebook has inside the fabricator suite the differentiation tool and well, make your choice, study it very good and I hope you do a call review. So here is Godzilla. Okay, so um, change sometimes can get hairy because you are in an organization and maybe you cannot, you don't have the tools or you don't have the, um, the um, you don't feel you have the power to do this. Um, so this is where I, well, I found these two guys there. I thought uh, that was a good representation of uh, some Japanese concepts like uh, Kainsen and uh, Kaikak. Um, these are very, uh, um, these are concepts very um, linked with the lean methodologies and agile and things like that. Um, the first one means uh, that you do incremental changes, that you do a change, you plan it, you measure it, and then you act, and then you do it again. So it's a cycle. Um, and the second one it means radical change. So maybe in your organization, incremental change just do not work because there is not enough, um, not enough uh, support or not enough um, commitment. So you may want to do a radical change and then you do incremental change. Say you don't use code review. You don't, you don't use peer review at all. Um, so everyone commits everyone. So one, one way to face it will be, well, let's try to do it in just one project. Let's try to do it in just one team. Let's try to do it very slowly. And the second, the second, um, option is yes, well, <laughs> you know, from Monday we do peer review. That's it. And then, <laughs> to look how, how it works. And um, another thing that is very similar to code review in terms of um, how you can implement it in, in a team is testing. Um, how I guess most of you do, do testing. Who, who does uh, something like BHAT or PHP unit for their projects? Okay, that's great. Um, but it is hard to do. It is hard to convince uh, teams and, um, and organizations to start to do it. And... Um, you need half a lamp. And 
plants go, go, go well or not. Well, well you, you have to have uh, patience as well. You have to evaluate the organization. Maybe your organization is not ready for doing BDD out of the box. Maybe, maybe you can't do TDD. I, I mean, Drupal 7 is not the friendliest thing to do TDD in the, in the market, to be honest. Maybe you implement your own stuff. You, there are tools like PHP spec that are out there. There are a lot of things. Um, you have to do, um, to do, uh, work for, um, making the tools easy and making the tools and adapt the tools to the team and not otherwise. Maybe your team is ready for, for some things, but not other. And, um, you have to sell the plan very well. And that's probably hard as well. And you have to show results. Why are we spending so much time and, and directly money in testing that doesn't release our projects faster. Um, you start small, but uh, don't stop. Don't don't leave it, even if it's frustrating. Those are oompa loompa and stunting on the same I see some of you like, what is that? <laughs> um, Pick your battles. That's the, that's the, the main thing. You you need to start small. You need you cannot test in, test everything. That is not possible. I mean, you won't have infinite budget. But hey, if you have infinite budget, um, just give me a call or something. Uh, you have to identify the key key areas. Uh, what the business rules are are important. The the um, the user interface is important. You have to identify what is the key area for your application and start testing that. And, and your day to day can kill you. It's like, oh, if you don't, if I don't integrate testing in the core, like I do things directly, the day to day just will, just will take, take all my time. I can do it. And performance is really, really important. Uh, if your test goes low, you don't want to spend time waiting for the test to finish. So that's a very important, that's a very important, often overlooked, uh, um, thing in, in testing. So you need to, to keep everything up to date because there is nothing as annoying as a test that it is not longer relevant. There is nothing, there is no worse enemy than that. Um, so tests should be a core process of your day to day document. Meet you. Um, developers, we are lazy. Come on. Uh, and we don't want to do this. <laughs> But uh, it is very difficult to convince uh, some developers that say, oh, we are not building rockets or planes. We don't need testing. Um, so we need to automate and make things fast. And if you have to look at it, it is not automated. Okay? That's, that's important. It, it is not that if you have to press the button and everything happens, well, you may have a hook or something that, that can, can, uh, can help you. And it is very important to not leave broken windows. You know, the, the broken window theory that you leave a building with a broken window one day and then, well, and then you, you end up with some, um, with a building tear up. You don't want that. So when a broken, when a test is breaking or, or you do a change and you break a test, that's actually good news. It's like, hey, this is, this is what that we are doing. It works. I mean, it's one of the things that when they, it breaks, it works. It means it's working. Don't leave broken tests. Wrong. If it's broken and you can't fix it, well, it's probably you need to either uh, evaluate if you want to fix it or if you want to just delete it. And code review helps a lot in this. Um, there is this um, Japanese uh, concept called kintsugi. Um, that's a ceramic, um, a ceramic base. So there is a, this Japanese craft that when uh, ceramic base is broken, they fix it with golden paste. So the result of that is a much more valuable product or a much more valuable and solid um, project or whatever. So make sure that your tests fix things with gold paste. Okay? So you don't get those annoying calls like, hey, you told me it was fixed. Your client calls and says, hey, this thing I told you last week, you told me it was fixed, but it's not. It's failing again. You don't want that call. So, very important. Stakeholders, whoever those may be for, for your case, need to be on board. It is very important if you, if you have people writing tests for you, like uh, your project managers, project owners, whatever, 
whatever who whoever you can involve in your in your uh, project and your testing it is very important um, because behavioral uh, driven development is not just behad it's about a whole set of philosophies like that say that you need to write the test first and the test needs to be uh, red and then you need to make it green you know that's if you're using behad doesn't necessarily mean you're using uh, bdd and um, Bihad is not just the language Bihad uses, it, it has a lot of implications. Um, so you can choose, test your business rules, test your user interfaces, um, test your APIs, your integrations with others, maybe that's the, your key, that's your thing, I don't know. Maybe you get calls from your client because the user interface fall, fails, maybe that's your main concern. Um, and you can choose different purposes, uh, tools for different purposes. That's, that's fine. And we're going to see a few, a few of those tools. So the, the first one that we are, um, this, this is going to be very Drupal, Drupal specific. Um, um, simple test. Uh, how many of you do tests with simple tests for your, uh, client projects? A few of you. Um, Simple test is, is, is really good in terms of being a Drupal specific and has all the tools. And, but it's pretty much only Drupal who uses this at this point in time. Um, it's really slow. And I don't think anyone can argue with that. Simple test is really slow because it goes and clicks and it does that inside of Drupal. Um, this is how a simple test, test look. So you have all your, all your Drupal things and you can do more more stuff like that. And this will, this will bootstrap Drupal and things like that. That's, that's expensive. You have to, you have to take care with this. And, and this is great to do integration between, between pieces of your code. You have PHP unit. Um, PHP unit is not straightforward to integrate with Drupal until Drupal 8. Okay. So if you're doing Drupal 8, you have that out of the box and that's great. That's a key thing because PHP unit is as fast as it gets. It's just practically immediate, and you want that. Um, but if you're doing Drupal 7, you can still use PHP Unit, but you have to modernize your code base greatly, which is good and is bad, because you have to spend time on that. And this is how a PHP Unit test looks like. And you can check Drupal 8 is full of those. Um, and you have to tell them, tell the PHP unit, because it's a unit test, doesn't know ever anything about anything. So it just tests one thing and one thing only. And you have to tell it what to expect, what to, what to have, what you have there. This is faking, uh, functions to call or methods to call. And, uh, that's good, but it's, it is, it is a change on, on perspective. And you can test, uh, interfaces as well. <laughs> I would say that if you have to test interfaces, you are better off with things like Behat than simple tests, but it's probably a matter of opinion. Um, Behat is a PHP tool and can test everything. There is a fairly good in integration with Drupal and extension, and you can integrate it further. Um, the main drawbacks of um, Behat, and it can, t it can test everything, JavaScript or anything, you can... Um, I throw Selenium tests and, and you can get the browser and see how the, you know, the small guy inside me had clicking in places, you know. Um, but if you do be had, you have to do, um, a dictionary based, um, phrases. Um, there's a be had, uh, test there. You know, this is very, you can read this, right? <laughs> and, um, and maybe your, your project managers and product owners can too and can write those. But you could end with all, with a really, really long glossary of things to keep, like, and I press, and I go to there, and I, and I do this action. And you can have a, you need to find a way to make that glossary meaningful and easy to browse, and easy to discover for, for new, for new people. Um, that said, um, if you don't have your, your project managers, your product owners on board, you may want to go for something like Casper GS or other tools similar. It is a JavaScript based testing framework and it uses, um, more or less, um, same tools that we had does, but in the JavaScript world, 
uh, it doesn't have any Drupal uh, integration. It's just a front-end testing tool. And it looks like, like this. It looks like a um, JavaScript thing. And this, and this you can't ask your, your product owner to write, right? But if they don't want to write tests, you may want to have code as your tests. Why not? If they are not on board, why would you bother on, on having meaningful, meaningful, uh, natural language tests? Maybe that's your tool. Um, that's it for testing, I think. Yeah. Yep. So, automate everything that is related, what we were saying that you don't want to make the same mistake twice, so you want to be vigilant around what you're doing, what processors are done by humans, and what can be automated. Uh, continuous integration is the main candidate to be, to be automated. It's very easy, it can be scripted. Uh, as I was talking, the code review made by machines, coding standards, complexity, good practices. You, you want your machines to, to run the, the test suites. You want to have the deployments under control. So you can deploy on a Friday afternoon. So once you, you reach this point, you get like send tranquility. And maybe you want to use something to generate your files to, push the code to the client because he's the one deploying the code, things like that. So this is your tool belt. Uh, Jenkins is a great tool. Maybe Travis, maybe Bamboo. Uh, you can use for your deployments Capistrano. Ansible also is going to provision your your machine. Chef, well, there is new kits on the block, like Docker is being talked lately a lot. Yeah, I mean... It it's uh, a matter of um, the same again with uh, code review and testing. So you need to choose, you need to know your organization, you need to know which tools you want to do. Uh, and if you want to automate something, uh, you need, you need, probably, your, chances are that you need some of these or similar names. So, for example, if you, if you do provisioning and you don't have any Ruby developer on the team or anyone that wants to get near Ruby, maybe you don't use Capistrano, use a uh, thing instead because you know PHP. And um, maybe you want you want a faster onboarding. Maybe you want to look into Docker. Maybe you have a DevOps person that can do Chef or Puppet. Maybe you don't have it. <laughs> so maybe you have someone that can build a Jenkins server and they know how to do it. Or maybe you want to pay Travis to host your continuous integration for you. Um, so it is a matter of know the know the guns you have to to do the job. Yeah, also on the developer side, there is now Grand, Golf, things like that. You have JavaScript fanatics yeah. in your team. You may have <laughs> end up using Golf to deploy. That's fine. So as a final note before taking questions or something, I wanted to say that I think all this quality approach is a new step forward on the pragmatism of free software that... We demonstrated that we are able to deliver tons of free software, but the quality is, hmm. So we need to focus now that in the current moment on how are we doing stuff so it has more quality, it's more pleasant to work with. So let's come to the sprints on Friday and, well, this is some, all the images that we have. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. So we have an open mic session yep. now. If you want to make some questions and say, well, your guys are so wrong on these things, yes. <laughs> feel free. Yeah, you, you need to you need to somehow, yeah. Otherwise I can repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, so uh, I know that you said Please that to the mic. Okay, I know that it fine. is it fine. Okay, uh, I know that you said that uh, having slow tests is a problem, but you always uh, reaching a point where you have uh, too many automated tests. I mean, too many, many, and uh, the automated uh, uh, tests becomes uh, slow. And uh, what we can do in at uh, that point?
What what should be the approach yeah, that, to that, to, yeah, to run yeah, only uh, business critical tests and to uh, run other tests uh, manually or how? That's a, that's a great question. That, that's where your continuous integration and automati automatization tools come in come into kicking and help you. Uh, you can explore. It depends on your application a lot, you know, but. Uh, you can explore like building your application with Docker, so the build doesn't take anything. So you deploy your Docker and you test there. Mm -hmm. You have things like the um, cloud now, very modern, very very, yeah. very fancy, and you can you can deploy machines that you run in parallel your tests. You can do things like um, the machine reviews and things. Uh, they don't need if you are reviewing your code as well as your as your as the testing, you can review the code without installing the site. Installing the site, so you have to break the thing in pieces. Mm -hmm. And probably a good idea is to um, things like Behat have a very smart smart tagging mechanism. Yeah, that you can tag your tests so you know what are core, what are not. So you say these are the ones that I want. Don't run all yeah, tests, exactly. but on run a specific Just run group this of tests. Yeah. because okay. this bit is critical, yeah. and everything else is. Nice to, to be tested, and if it, but this is broke. If it's broken, I won't get a call right away. This is broken, so you have to identify your. You have to pick your battles in your testing as well. Yeah, what's not critical, you don't run it very often. That's what we. Yeah, did. maybe you have an idly yeah, that runs exactly. your criticals, and you have a whenever a change is made, I run I run the core tests. Oh, okay, okay. Or I was in a in a in a project that we tested every. Garrett change, even if it was a, a line of CSS. So we learned to mark things as this shouldn't trigger a test every time it's committed. Okay. Things like that. That's valuable. Thank you. For, for checking code style, there's code sniffer. I'd like to know if anyone has real life experience with the other tool that comes with it to automatically fix a number of those code styles. For example, adding a period to the line. Do people that use it still learn to do it themselves or don't we care, just do it automatically ever, always? I, I know how to automate it, but I think it's a very good practice. Like I, I have it on the development side. I automatically fix my files, but well. You're saying that not only your, if you, if you run, uh, automated, uh, mess detector, a code, as mean, niffer, that the tool itself will fix your code. The, the, there is, there is with code sniffer also a tool that can do it automatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but my, my, my concern is, do people, uh, uh, still learn to do it right? Or don't we care? Just like using a calculator, you don't, uh, you, 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 uh, you can't uh, uh, calculate in your mind uh, anymore. You need to calculate it. Do we care or do we don't we care? I mean, um, if you have a human review and you get a review that is you're missing a dot, it's like, well, okay. But um, I don't know if I will feel comfortable with a tool fixing those automatically, like every commit or something. But I guess a good thing is to have like an IDE configuration file somewhere that makes sure that uh, every developer has the same code standards in their machines. So I think this is a problem that eventually, you know, can be fixed over time. I wouldn't say it's a big thing, but if you have a Drupal 7 thing that you want to move to Drupal 8, you want to, you don't want to be Worrying about coding standards, you have to have those fixed by then, right? And, and that we agree on, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you you say just to summarize for other people who can't maybe can't hear you, you you say many IDEs have an integration, I yeah with code sniffer yeah.
That is also for Drupal that's, 7. Yeah. That's that's the yes, one I was PCB talking about, the automator. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, still my questions unanswered. Is it yeah. is it good or when is it good to use it, the automated uh, uh, fixer, and when is it not good to use it? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's that's the discussion maybe yeah, maybe for the right. recording is whether to use automated fixing or not. And <coughs> And Joao comments that maybe if you have a huge number of problems, maybe you do a cleanup with automating things. If you, if you have automated tests, you know, it's, it's less risky. But if you don't have automated tests, if you don't have that, um, I don't know, maybe you can fix the dot thing. But if you have other things like renaming comments or something, uh, that's that's more... That's different, that's different, right? Yeah. Just one, one, one last question. Uh, Rodrigo mentioned some very great things we get from code review, especially when we work as part of a team. But I have a question for Pedro as a freelancer, and I don't know if this is the case. But if you work on a solo project, you are by yourself, you have no team uh, with you that can review your code. What practices do you, do you suggest to review your code instead of uh, other than yourself, obviously, and also having testing in mind, but it's not exactly the same? Yeah, this is uh, a great question. I normally work with teams when I'm freelancing now, but it is uh, like the question of do you do agile on your own, right? I don't, I don't know. It depends. How complicated is the stuff you're working on? Um, but I have the, I have the um, idea that, um, if you, if you are selling something to a client, the client doesn't, if you do testing, it is not that it's something that the client should say you do it or not. It is something that comes with your, uh, with your, uh, product or whatever you're selling, right? So, um, having a Jenkins for yourself, well, it depends. Do you maintain the client websites? Or is this something that you do and then you let off? Well, well it depends. Uh, that's it, a, that's a yeah. If you if you are maintaining it, maybe it, maybe it's worth it. Why not? Maybe you can have some testing for for some stuff. If the client is maintaining it, well. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. So one question on the tools. You mentioned some tools for continuous integration and for deployment. Um, you also mentioned that uh, sometimes it's good to review only the smelly parts of the code. Uh, but how do you detect? Because if, if I'm putting myself in the head of a very lazy programmer that has done some really smelly code and doesn't want that doesn't want the hassle of going through a lengthy uh, code review. So what I'm going to tell you is the smelly code is the code that I'm actually more proud of and the one that has less problems. I'm going to try and hide away under the, the rug the, the really smelly code. So what kind of other tools? Because code sniffer, okay, tells you, yeah, this is where he left out some points or some he left some extra white space or some very stupid things. But real code analysis, which tools should we use? Well, if we have PMD, PHP mess detector, that is going to tell you, well, and not only that, you can also maybe, based on performance, the code that is not based on a, 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 a prof, yeah. I would say, 
I know that this is not your question, but I would say <laughs> ask the current or former developers. They will know what is the smelly part. It's like ask what is what is the thing that you wouldn't touch in this project? That is what you have to test or you have to be the parts without tests also. I guess when 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 we said this as uh, review the smelly parts, we wanted to mean start somewhere, start somewhere that had adds value, whatever it adds more value. I guess. I did. I ate the IE18N module since then. <laughs> okay, the recommendation was blackfire.io for testing performance. Yeah. Okay, I think we should... <laughs> okay, so, so, so look for the usual suspects in Drupal, like who in it or uh, uh, crazy alters or things like that. Okay, that's good. So the comment was that the Drupal API is going to tell you what are the dangerous hooks and things well, like you know, that. You know what are the, where, where the big hooks are, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hook in, for example, hook water, for the recorder. <laughs> so I think we should. Yeah, Thank that's you. a wrap up. Thank, Thank you, everyone. <laughs>